that's, it's so great that you're here. I'm, I'm doing this study, and I just need a couple of more subjects. So can I ask you a couple of questions? Yeah? Great, thank you, thank you so much. Okay, just raise your hand if it's a yes, and keep your hand down if it's a no. Super easy, yeah? First question. Have you heard of technology entertainment design? T-E-D. Anyone? I see 90, keep your hands up please. 93 point. 9.34%, yeah, great. Um, second question, do you have the flu? <laughs> but like, really bad, high fever, can't get out of bad flu. Zero percent, wow. I guess TED must make you healthy, right? Very interesting, this. Impressive. Um, last question, this week, have you seen a number? This can be anything, um, a percentage, an average, uh, a graph. Have you seen a number in the news? Quite a lot. Thank you, this was great, really helpful. So let me introduce myself. My name is Sonne Blau and I am a number nerd. And my addiction started when I was quite young. In fact, one of my very first memories was about numbers. You remember these? Connect the dots? These I actually did myself when I was about four years old. And I was on this vacation with my family in Germany, and I was just doing one after the other after the other. S super addictive. Then, fast forward 20 years, um, I was doing my PhD. I was collecting data, analyzing data, and still, in a very different way, but still looking for these patterns in numbers. And now I'm a journalist, and I write about the value of data and statistics. And I think it's just that, that we can see certain patterns, and those patterns can teach us something about the world. So it's no wonder that our news is full of numbers. Whether it's some headline about refugees coming from an international organization, whether it's uh, the outcome of a political poll, or whether it's some groundbreaking new health insight based on statistical analysis. Smelling farts might prevent cancer. Before you get too excited, this one turned out to be bogus, so behave yourselves, please, also up there. Great. Um, but whatever they are, these numbers, they shape the way we view the world. They tell us what to eat, they tell us what kind of medicines we should take when we get ill. Um, they tell us how the economy is doing and who we should vote for. So it's very important that these numbers, that they are correct, that we can trust them. Sadly though, many of those statistics in the news that are supposed to inform us, they actually misinform us. As a wise man once said, torture numbers and they'll confess to anything. And our news today, sadly, is full of such tortured numbers. So I think it's time for some statistical self-defense. Today I want to talk about the five most common statistical lies that you see in the newspaper every single day. Are you ready? Great. One, the good-looking graph. You know these graphs that you see in the newspaper, on the news? And they just look too good to be true. And Quite often, they actually are a bit too good to be true. Take this one. This graph was shown in the American Congress, in the midst of a huge discussion about Planned Parenthood, this health organization. And one Republican uh, congressman put this graph up, and he said, look, Planned Parenthood is doing less and less cancer screening and prevention services. The blue line is going down, and the purple line abortions are going up dramatically quite steep. So he said, we should cut funding to this organization because why should we spend our taxpayers' money on things that aren't saving lives? Something weird with this graph, though, because look at the numbers. The upper right-hand corner says 327,000. Below, it says 950,000 and a little bit. You don't really need a PhD in statistics to know that lower numbers should be lower on the graph. So what happened here? 
This graph uses two different scales. If you put them on the same scale, the message is very different. Okay, cancer screening and prevention is still going down, but abortions have hardly moved. Second statistical line, the polluted poll. Well, we already did quite a polluted poll just now, I think. Um, but there are many other polls out there in the news. This one, for instance. One in four women experience sex assault on campus. This was a headline in New York Times. And it's incredibly shocking, right? 25% of female college students have to deal with sex assault. Fortunately, though, it's also probably exaggerated. And the researchers admit this. They say there's probably a bias upwards. But the New York Times didn't mention this in the article. So what is the issue here? Well, three things. One, a very small sample of universities participated. Two, at those universities, more than 80% of the women did not respond to the questionnaire. And three, the definition of sexual assault was a very broad one here. In fact, the researchers didn't even, or they avoided the word assault because it's a very loaded term. So what could happen is that a girl at a party being hit on by a guy and rejecting him, she might be coined a victim by this survey, even though she would not call that assault herself. So someone in the Huffington Post said, hey, maybe the New York Times should have had this as a headline. Approximately one in four of 90% of non-represented sample of women who responded to non-represented survey of trans reported experience sexual assault with sexual assault take to mean anything from the, being on the receiving end of an unsolicited kiss to first world penetration gunpoint, regardless of the particular context. <sighs> I hope you're still awake, because <laughs> this is not really clickbait material. Um, but it is the more honest story here, right? And I think when we talk about something as serious as sexual assault, we should also take the facts seriously. So third statistical line, the overconfident decimal point. Our news is full of very precise numbers, with two or three digits behind the decimal point. And that gives the impression that these numbers must be true, objective, because they're so precise. Well, let's take a look at one, the, kind of the queen of these things, GDP growth. GDP growth is an important number because based on this statistic, economists tell us whether our country is in recession or not. So last year, statisticians in the United States announced that April to June 2015, the GDP growth was 2.3%. A month later, I said, oh, sorry, 3.7%. Another month later, I said, oh, wait, 3.9%. So it jumped so much in such a short period. Does this mean that these statisticians were not doing their job well? No. What this means is that GDP is incredibly difficult to calculate, and it takes time. Just look at this very boring table. Don't even bother reading it. But um, just to show you all the components that go into GDP, there are a lot. So it takes time to get good, accurate data on these. So no wonder that these statisticians were revising the numbers as they went. So you might wonder, like, why should I care? I never liked economics in high school. And, well, this probably didn't make you more excited about it. So why should you care now, right? Well, let me give you an example. Two researchers looked at 40 years of data in the United Kingdom. And they took an older data set and they concluded there were 10 recessions in those 40 years. With a better data set, so with newer, better data, they concluded there were only seven. So three whole recess recessions disappeared simply because they got better numbers. And these were periods in which people were fired, in which politicians won elections over over bad economic circumstances. Periods in which countries were in complete chaos because of this supposed recession. So maybe you should care. <laughs> okay, fourth, 
the spectacular statistic, or I should say, the not so spectacular statistic. This is kind of the Tom Cruise of statistics. You know, in movies, he looks impressive, right? Wow. Well, the suit really helps as well, but still, you know Tom Cruise, he always looks awesome and powerful and everything. Put him in context, though. <laughs> eh, yeah. I prefer the previous one. Anyway, the same goes with statistics. Sometimes you add a little context and they look very different. Take this one, for instance. People who eat processed meat daily have a 20 times higher risk of getting bowel cancer. This was the headline in the Dutch news. Well, a little bit after they said, oops, sorry, it was 20% higher. Quite a difference, but, um, but still, 20%, still a high number, right? At least high enough for a lot of media here and in the United States and in other countries, for a lot of media to write about this. But the right question here is, 20% of what? Because 20% of a small number is still a very small number. So let's take a look. In the United States now, the chance to get bowel cancer is about 4.4%. If you eat some extra meat, 50 grams, which is about one hot dog. If you eat a hot dog per day extra, that number goes from 4.4 to 5.2%. Already quite less impressive than that big 20% we saw before. Even less impressive it gets when you look at the chance of not getting cancer. Because that is 95.6% in the first case, 94.8% if you eat this extra hot dog per day. Still important information if you decide about your diet, but not as spectacular Tom Cruise as we saw before. Last one. The cocky correlation. The fact that two things happen at the same time or happen to the same people, that doesn't mean that one causes the other. Let's take a look at this graph. Annual incidence of brain tumors. This is in the United States and it goes from mid-70s to mid-90s. And you see something weird happening in mid-80s. You see all of a sudden this graph shifts upwards. It's quite a big shift. And the researchers that published this graph said, hey, what's going on here? And they had an answer. They said, it must have been this. NutraSweet. This artificial sweetener that was introduced in the United States just a couple of years before this big shift in the graph. We you know what else happened in the mid-80s? I don't know, Band-Aids? Microsoft Word? Um, I happened mid-80s, so all very life-changing events, obviously, but, um, but still, without any additional information, I am just as likely to have caused that big increase in brain tumors as NutraSweet. You know what? There was a much more plausible explanation, and that's this. MRI scanners. Before, some brain tumors just went unnoticed because they didn't have the instruments to actually detect them. And now, mid-80s, more and more MRI scanners were around in the United States, so more tumors were actually noticed. So this is only one example where correlation is being mixed up with causality. And to me, this is kind of the most dangerous statistical lie of the five, because it so easily links to action. Once, for instance, I tell you that TED Talks are super healthy, you might decide to just, you know, spend all your time sitting in theaters like this and watching TED Talks all the time because you want to be super healthy. You might even quit your job. But that's a silly example, of course. But um, look at this one. This is a graph from Vox.com, and it's about drug-related arrests in the United States. And you see that black Americans were more than two and a half times as likely to be arrested for drug-related offenses than white Americans. And the easy conclusion here is, hey, well, being black must make you a criminal, right? Because look at, look at the stats. And then the action could be obvious. 
Maybe the police should go to black neighborhoods, should single out black individuals, because that's where the bad stuff happens, right? We see it here in the numbers. But look at this one. Black Americans are not more likely to use drugs. They're also not more likely to sell drugs. So that correlation, that should be second-guessed. And probably the whole reason that we see that big difference is those racist police practices in the first place. So I think we should defend ourselves against this cocky correlation and also against all the other four statistical lies that I talked to you about. Because if we don't watch out, these bad statistics, they end up hurting ourselves, hurting other people, and hurting society. So thank you.